All right, here with Perry Keith, head coach at Connor State, 37th season, uh, over 1,700 wins, but uh, first in wins for active NJCA coaches. Yeah. So, Coach Keith, thanks for jumping on with me. Good. I think that bio is probably, oh, 39 years. I'm in my 39th year. Well, you got to tell your SID. If, yeah, yeah, so <laughs> pass by in a hurry. <laughs> and you guys are off to another good start. I mean, you're 26 and four, unless it hasn't been updated here, you know, just yeah. on your website. You guys are 26 yeah. and four right yeah, now. So we, you're off to we, another good start. Yeah, we are. We got a, we got a good club. We're, we're solid. We, we can hit and run. We hit, got a little power. We run a little bit. We play really good defense. And uh, we our, our starting pitch has been good. Our bullpen, we throw strikes. And uh, one thing we haven't done, we don't beat ourselves. So that's it's uh, and it's been a good, easy group to coach. They they take care of their stuff. It's been fun. Well, you guys are almost hitting four hundred as a team. Yeah, yeah. That's hard to do. Yeah, it is. And and uh, you know we've had a little hiccups along the way. Last Friday we couldn't score all of a sudden, and I was kind of proud. I seen some, you know how it is. I seen some frustration with our hitters. We, we played at Seminole Friday, opened up a three game series, and we left guys on base and just couldn't get anything going. And for the first time all year, and you know, you always talk about adversity and how you're going to handle it. You never know till it happens. And uh, we we got off the bus and getting on the bus coming home, you could see though they were frustrated, seeing guys running down the line, grinding out, frustrated. And so, hey, we've talked about this and. I was really proud how they bounced back Saturday and we swept and scored runs and, you know, it, it's baseball. It's not if, it's when all of a sudden you can't score, you know, <laughs> and there's no explanation. It just, it's baseball and uh, just have to handle it. As a coach, when you know that, is that just, you kind of stay steady through that? Cause you know, you're going to come back. Obviously those numbers prove out that at some point the law of averages is they're going to come back. Do you just try to stay patient with that? Yeah, and, and you try to, you know, we talk and spend a lot of time about mental stuff in, in the fall. We have meetings, everything we call Champions Class that we've done for years. And, and it's about, I, I'm big on visualization and just imagery and relaxing. And, and uh, you know, I think Ken Ravizza, the, the book he wrote, maybe is the best thing in the world for baseball players. And, and we use a lot of stuff out of that. And But you talk about how you're going to handle that. But you can talk about it all day until you're you think that you're invincible to play, and then all of a sudden you go about 0 for 15 and like a little different doing it and talking about it. So you know. And one thing I've always told people, uh baseball's a little different gig. I don't think you can coach or officiate this game very good if you've never failed at it. And all of us have played have fell flat on our face millions of times and and um, so, yeah, if, if you got the right kids and I just like, guys, but we've all been through it. And sometimes it's in opportune times. Uh, we had a good run last year and all of a sudden we got in the playoffs and couldn't score one game. And you just hope that's when it doesn't happen. And again, if, if you could figure out the reason and fix that, we we all have it made, but you can't. So when did you start your champions class? When did you start that? I've probably been at doing 25 or 30 years. Yeah. Who nudged yeah. you to do that? Did you read Heads Up Baseball and then like this? Oh, yeah. And I tell you what we do. Yep. We have bought books. Years ago, I bought the paperback version, about 40 or 50 of them. And we check them in and out to our players and we use them. And we do other things off that, but the book is still it's. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to hear him speak years ago at an ABCA, ABCA convention years ago. And, man, it was like – and the guy gets it because it's not hocus-pocus. He talks about the mental deal, but over and over he's ex he always said, this doesn't replace hard work. And, and Harvey Dorfman was, was where I started. I started as a player in high school with, with – Harvey Dorfman's yeah. a mental yeah. ABCs and that's my only like disappointment he was older at that time and so he was kind of on his way out where I wish we would have been able to get him to speak at a at an ABCA convention yeah. because he was kind of the yeah. godfather because he was starting before Revisa was um because he was working with Tony La Russa with the Oakland Athletics for a long yeah. time that's another really good book is the uh yeah. mental toughness training for for baseball players is a really good book because the Keel brothers we're working with Dorfman and the athletics 
um, yeah. in their mental skills. They the athletics were doing mental skills stuff in the eighties way before anybody yeah. else was doing it. Yeah, it's good. And there's stuff. a reason Tony LaRusso won as many games as he did. No, as a manager. exactly. Yeah, and you know we we morph life skills into it. We talk about uh, you know the big thing with me is is what kind of father you gonna be, what kind of husband you gonna be, and I, I break it down to guys like, hey, are you gonna be one of those guys that's Got to pick up with a lift kit on it and big rims and a bass boat and you're upside down on payments and your little girl needs braces. You know, you're selfish, you know. Uh, what are you going to do when you come home one day and you think you got money to make it to the end of the month and the wife says the air conditioner's out, you know. You suck it up. And we talk about Vietnam. We talk about D-Day. And, uh, it, and we morph that into with baseball, you know, which – I saw the press release where, when the field got named after you, and that was one of the, the quotes that stuck out um, from the Board of Regents talking about how you do such a good job of, of building men and raising men just as much as the wins. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, I've had 14 big leaguers, and you sit back and think about that, like, that's nuts. And we've had two guys win, be on World Series championship teams back-to-back -back years. I was in St. Louis in 06 when the Cardinals won. John Rodriguez, and I was – in Denver, when Julio Lugo and the Red Sox won, beat the, the Rockies. And it's, you know, our coaches are we're too dumb to smell the roses. It's always on to the next one. And, but the thing I'm most proud of, you know, I, I have hundreds upon hundreds of major league men and husbands out there that keep perpetuating in our program. And, and that's what I'm most proud of. Do you feel like that's the key to longevity in, in coaching is is focusing on that piece of, of building the, the person first? Do you think that keeps you away from some of the stresses that you have to deal with as a coach? Yeah, it's all culture. You know, you got to have a culture and something you believe in and, and make sure your kids believe it because you want to stay off the roller coaster, you know, up one day and down the next. And so, uh, you know, as I tell people, the fall is – is a little bit like a rodeo boot camp deal, man. It's just nuts, guys. Especially the junior college, you get all these new guys and coming in and being being on time. You know, just all the little things. It's just constant. And you feel like you're you're constantly bitching and griping at guys over just little stuff. And then you kind of at some point in your career go, you know what? These guys that they don't get it. I'm spending all my time bitching at these four or five guys. I need to be praising these 20 or 25 guys for what wonderful young men they are. And sometimes we forget that. And I think probably 10, 15 years ago, I, that kind of dawned on me, you know. And when you get to this point in the spring, a coach's job to me in college is to take care and uplift and pick everybody up. You know, I think in the fall you're beating the hell out of them, you know, mentally and, and everything. But now it's – I need to rest them, support them, lift them up through hard times. Because, you know, this game, this stuff's not easy for, for anybody. You know, people think it is. You're, there's failure and fatigue and the whole nine yards. So, yeah, it, it's building a culture is, is the thing that makes it and more well, kids, kids are smart, too. So do you feel like that kind of eliminates some of the issues, too? Because if I'm a player, if I'm one of those 30 players – and I see coach paying attention to the guys that are doing things right. If I want to put myself in that position, then I'm gonna I'm gonna to gravitate towards starting to do things right. And there's obviously gonna be some kids that don't get it, and and those ones don't need to be there anymore. Addition yeah. by subtraction, you know. That's yeah. my dad used to talk about addition by subtraction a lot. Exactly. I think kids are smart. I don't think we give kids enough credit where if, yeah. if they see, hey, coach is paying attention and spending time with the guys that are doing everything right. I need to jump in that camp, and and that kind of alleviates some of those headaches. Yeah. Too. Yeah, you're, you're right. And, and you know, people, there's still a lot of wonderful young men. I, I could sit here and tell you stories day after day about what guys have done here for other people and each other. And, and I, I think the other thing, we have such a melting pot. You know, we, we've got kids from Canada. We've got kids from Latin America. We've got kids from Oklahoma, from the Midwest. We've got kids that family has money. We've got kids that can't rub two nickels together. And... They don't care. They don't care. They don't care what color they are. They, and that that's, I always tell people, if the rest of the world would get on our bus one time, 
I've said that if you want if you want people to fix things, get baseball people involved with trying to fix yeah. what we've got on going bus, on. Get on our bus, man. It's just it. yep, and nothing sacred. Everybody's going to get whacked, but everybody takes care of each other. And you know, it, it's yeah, it, it's I, I, you know, my first year, you know, obviously playing in college, I seen it. But my first year, I, I never forget the head coach. I, I walked on the bus one night and just looked back there. You know, what a menagerie of people. And I thought, man, this is something. And I, I'm hooked on that. I, I just, you know, kids, we have kids here. Some of our kids from Latin America are just so thankful for everything. And I laugh and I tell people they think our cafeteria is the Golden Corral. Yeah. You know, and that's wonderful. Yeah, and, that, you know, that's good for your kids that come from wealthier backgrounds, too, to see that, hey, you know, yeah. Uh, the, uh, as they say at first world problems those first world problems when you see somebody that actually has third world problems that that gives you a yeah. little bit different perspective on things You're exactly I, I see it every day at what point did you say hey connor's is is where i'm gonna be well you know you know i started here i i i played here then i i, I went to missouri state Played and I graduated from there in '83. Played for Coach Rowe, Coach and, Rowe. I, and I and then Keith Gatton. Uh, I I was a senior on his first team, and then uh, I came back here as an assistant one year. And and the guy who I played for here left, took my job, and man, I hit the ground running, and and here we went. And you know, I started getting some job offers, and I, I'm telling you, Gary Ward and and Tom Holiday. Uh, I mean, we still, I still talk to those guys. They did so much for me. And I sent them a lot of players. We were, they, man, I'm telling you, and Coach Seymour at OU, they, they were so good to me. Uh, but that's the first thing that I, sticks out when you look at your website is the Oklahoma State uniform. Yeah. Yeah. We have the <laughs> but we, uh, you know, I started getting some job offers and some assistance and this, this and that, and then some head jobs and, and, uh, the summer of '96, I, I flew to a place and uh, come home, and my wife and kids went up to my parents' house. So my wife come and picked me up and went back to my parents' house where the kids were. They live about an hour away. And I told my dad, and my dad kind of stayed out of my career. He was just a smart guy, but stayed out of my career. And, and uh, I uh, told him that night, I said, I think I'm going to take that job. And he looked at me and he goes, that would be the dumbest thing you've ever done. And I'm kind of getting most of my dad, we lost him in 2016, but it crushed me for my dad to say, I said, why would you say that? And uh, he pointed at my two kids. I have a daughter and a son. My daughter was probably uh, nine at the time. And I think my son was probably four or five. And they were there on the floor. One was asleep. I can remember, like, Jerry, he pointed at them and he goes, you drag them everywhere you go. You put them on the bus with you. You take them everywhere you go with you. And my wife and them and they get on the bus and travel with us. And, and uh, he said, you won't be able to do that there. And he was right. And, you know, I, I, I didn't take the job. And God's blessed me. This is, this is where I need to be. And uh, junior college baseball is wonderful. Uh, it's grassroots baseball. And... Uh, I've, I've been blessed. Or, you know, I love this school. Uh, we got a good president. Dr. Ramming's a wonderful guy. I can truly say he's a friend of mine. Or it, It's just Warner's a little small town. People come here and go, holy cow. But once you get here, this is this is a great place. And, and you know, I've been blessed with health. And uh, so, yeah, I've stayed here. And a lot of people say, how in the hell did you stay in Warner, Oklahoma all the years? And I'm, when it look, makes it easier too. Though. And I'm like, won a lot of how games. the heck have I been so blessed? You've won a so, lot of games. Yeah, That's a lot of games. Yeah. And your son's yeah. coaching with you now? Yeah, he sure is. He he was an All American here, then went to Southern Arkansas and played for them. You know, Justin Pettigrew played for me. He's at Southern Ark, and uh, then he came back and and uh, he's a director of housing here, and he's one of our assistants. Him and then other other one is Jackson Field, who also played for me. And, been blessed with a good staff. They pick. I I tease them all the time now. You know, they they pick on me because I'm old and don't know this or that. So we have we have ageism issues sometimes. That's what I tell them. But uh, 
Now, and it, it's fun. Like I said, when you got good players and good kids, you know how how you know my dad was a union worker. You know, worked the same job forty two years, made a good living, but he worked. You know, here I'm coaching baseball and getting paid. I, I'm I'm blessed. That's also seeing by example too. That see what your dad has done for a living forever, and you're like, okay, yeah. I don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I never heard him complain or, or anything. So, yeah. I mean, not being not growing up around coaches, I grew up around them. So, like, I kind of saw that. Who inspired you to to look towards coaching as a as well, a service? You know, kind of my dad. He was involved in athletics. My dad, and and then I just as I started playing sports, I was a three sport athlete in in uh, high school. Some of my favorite people were coaches. You know, just learning from them and. You know, time I got to, to Missouri State, I knew this is what I wanted to do. And the guy told me, hey, I got a job for you. And like I said, I graduated in May and went to work here in June that year. And, uh, uh, you know, so and did I, you lean I on Coach Rowe Rowe and Coach Gutton then when you when you got the job as the head coach? Did you lean on those guys? Oh, you of talk course. Talk about Gary Ward, too. I mean, obviously, yeah, Gary of, Ward of course. Close, you know, a, I remember Coach Coach, coach Rowe Ward's a good one to be close to. And, and Coach yeah. Gutton's close, too. Those are two yeah, really good that, ones. You know, we by. still use a lot of stuff here that we, we did at Missouri State. I, I have. I think defense. about offensive teams because I, when I was at Evansville, Missouri State, we were in the same league together, and those teams yeah. always hit. They always yeah. hit. Yeah. Yeah, I use a lot of the same stuff, still do. And I, I remember when I got this job, Coach Rowe told me, he said, Perry, surround yourself with good people. Yep. Pretty simple and good advice. How has the landscape of junior college baseball changed over the years for you? I mean, the draft shortened now. Draft yeah. yeah. Portal, NIL, there, there's a lot of other stuff outside of your guys' control that you're having to deal with. Yeah, there, there's two things I see. It's – I think it's more difficult for – used to guys were beating the door down here. I didn't have to get on the phone to get guys out of here. Guys were beating the door down. I have to do that now. I don't have I, – I do. we do have – more proactive, I guess, would be the word, calling because of the portal and, I guess, and all that stuff. So that that's changed a little bit, just getting guys placed. Good players that I've had in the past that – I think are probably good enough playing the Big Twelve or SEC, or you know, kind of getting looked over, or, and they're going to places. But that, that's that's different. Uh, the other thing I've seen, and I think it's probably because of the draft and and the draft and follow, and maybe social media. I, I see more and more kids that don't need to go to a Division One school that are that I used to could come in and go head up with. A Division One Power Five is going to say, "Look, you know, here's here's not only the thing playing time, but practice time. You know, we get in here in August and we're still going in November. You know how important that is for a freshman, opposed to what they're so limited. That, but those kids, most of them, that goes right over their head. So that's changed. Yeah, they you they just, more kids they get, view it different now." They, yeah, they just view that, and I I think social media's got something to do, and that early it has commit a lot to deal, do with it. That early commit deal to me is nuts, you know. Uh, you know, we had Jeff Salazar here. He's a been a big league hitting coach, and now he's in the Dodgers organization. He he played in the big leagues for a while, and he uh, went on to Oklahoma State and played for for Tom when Tom was there and got drafted. He got drafted out of here. I signed him. June after his senior year. No way. I had a guy call me and I tell you how good I thought he was. This is this is nuts. And I tell this and we laugh about it all the time. I had, you know, I'd saw him and a little skinny left-handed hitter and could run a little bit. And I thought, you know, he might. And I called him and he finally said, Yeah, that, that's what I'm gonna do. Well, back then, you know, the letter and tents for just paper, you'd fax them or take them to him and how important he was. I, I went to Arkansas that day to, to go see some kid, and I sent my wife and Corey, my son, went to Putnam City, which is two hours from here, to take him his letter of intent. Corey's like six or seven years old. Sherry sat in the car. Corey ran the letter of intent up to, in his house and signed it and brought it back. So important he was. 
You play in the big leagues. Sherry sounds like she's a heck of a recruiting coordinator. I know. <laughs> so I'm like, you never know. And you know, here's a guy like that hanging around in in June. That was probably in July after he graduated. You know, those days are for long. Well, gone. how many of those? You know, you've had a, a, so many guys sign. You've had so many big leaguers. How many of those guys were late bloomers? Exactly. Exactly. There's tons of them. We got guys on our team right now, and you know that's like pitching all this velocity stuff. I I'm still out trying to find that 80 to 85 mile an hour guy that's got frame and can spin it and pitch. When those guys pop, man, you've got something. You know they they I couldn't throw the ball by people growing up. I they get out. I get out in the spring a little bit here early just to see. We get we got so much good baseball here in North Carolina. But I saw yeah. Northwestern's Friday guy is at 83 tops left hander, but the changeup is plus. He yeah. had Duke baffled. Yeah, and Duke Duke's having a heck of a season. He had yeah. Duke baffled, and it just showed yeah. you like if you have some deception. That 83 played up to about 90 because the changeup was so good. There's still some yeah. value for guys that can pitch. Yeah. You know, Jordan Romano was here. And bless his heart, he was the hardest worker. And, you know, he took his lumps in the minors. There, there was times that he couldn't pitch here for us. And he would just be so frustrated. I'd say, Jordan, your better days are ahead. And that same year, we had a kid, a little left-hander, was about 5'9", through 80, 81 miles an hour. And he was 10-0. and 0. You know. Because he could throw that breaking ball at midnight, you know, it didn't matter. He and and by the fifth, sixth inning, you think that guy was throwing a hundred, you know, and yeah, and Jordan, he just kept hanging in there, and you knew his best days were, and he went on to ORU, and and still, you know, heck, he got passed back and forth two or three times before he, and now look at him. So, can you create work ethic something. for players? Pardon me. Can you create work ethic for players? I think you can teach them how to work. You know, some kids work hard, but they don't know what the heck they're working on, you know, the wrong stuff. But, you know, you know, in this game, to me, if you don't, I think you can create culture and, and how to work. And, well, what's that that deal, you know? I'm kind of, you, you got that rule, you got 20% are already there, and you got 30 that ain't ever going, and then the one straddling the fence, you, you can then. But, you know, a lot of kids work hard and they don't know how to work or how to practice to, to get better. And I'm I'm a no-frills guy. I'm a fundamentalist. Nothing fancy. Uh, and that's what I tell guys. Stuff we do is purposeful. I, I'm not into busy work. Let's, let's do stuff purposeful and it's boring to do the same stuff every day. Because, it, you know, it's, you got one chance when it's time to put it in play. You got one chance when a ball's hit to you. You got one chance to execute a breaking ball what what are you doing leading up to that that's everything better be, when you're in the weight room it better be what am i doing to make myself a better baseball player you know that's that's kind of what like i said i'm i'm a simpleton when it comes to that stuff you start in the classroom first every day no we talk we talk before but you no, know we dug go, out we go to the field and start doing early work but oh yeah we talk about what we're going to do every day and the purpose of it we sure do and we spend time in the classroom at night during champions class and stuff. We'll, and, you know, in the fall, we'll, we'll meet three or four nights a week. How much is spent on time management with them? You talk about working smarter, not harder. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. You're exactly right. Just doing that and managing everything in your life. Yeah. Uh, and we meet. I, I've created a monster. We, we meet in the dorm lounge or in a, we're in a hotel in a lounge. But we have a home game, road game. We meet every night before game, about 15, 20 minutes. And we talk about visualization, relaxation and stuff. I, You know, you kind of create a monster doing that. And you know, you'd be at home and it's 9.30 at night and right here to the dorm to meet. But I, I think that's good for kids because the thing that I don't like is roller coaster stuff. I, you know, you should – you're playing against the game, whether you're playing the Yankees or the Bad News Bears. That, that's kind of what I preach to these guys. We, You don't want – we want to be on an even kill, and you try to get that same mindset to lead into playoffs where you're not, ah, you know. It's, visualization helps with that to, to, yeah, to, to stay it's great. Do you script out the visualization for them? Yeah, I, I go through it. I walk them through it. Love it. Love we it. go the, the whole nine yards. I walk them How through it. How long does it take your script when you're walking them through it? How long? We, we spend – my meeting's probably 15 to 20 minutes. 
Well, okay, you got to get in there. I think that's the thing for somebody that hasn't done it or hasn't coached somebody yeah. to do it. There's yeah. a process to get in there. It takes some time, so it is going to yeah. be ten to fifteen because it's going to take them a little time yeah. to get in there. Yeah, we, we got to, through the whole. They've got to get that that the that seven. We got through the whole breathing, breathing get deal. Calm down. We get them the breathing. Talking about the breathing, then then we go through. And I kind of have the hitters doing stuff and the pitchers at the same time. And I walk the pitchers through fastballs, out of winds up stretch. Curveballs, wipe out curveballs, change. Then we go to defensive stuff. And yeah. Like I said, people don't, you know, if, you, if you're going to be good at this, you have to invest. You have to. And some people want to do this, they don't invest the time. And there's, a, I tell people all the time, they don't want to hear, man, you've done this. There's a price to pay. <laughs> you know, there is. I mean, I've missed out on stuff. And I'm, I'm blessed with a wonderful family that's understanding and, uh, they're invested in this place and my wife, you know, and good look, you know, somebody to never worry about when you're getting home, you know, and that's there's, there selfish. has to be a lot of trust there. Yeah. For, for longevity you know, just, of family yeah. in our profession, there has to be trust between the husband and the wife because you're just not, if you want to be good, you're just not going to be there sometimes. You're just, yeah. I mean, there's just such an investment. Like I said, it comes with, it comes with a price that, just I'm sure your kids have enjoyed every minute of it. You talk oh, about yeah. being on you the know, bus, now I've got, like at somebody that lived yeah. in. Those and now are, I've got my some grandkids of my best out memories there. Of, of being on the bus when I was yeah. a kid. Still, still yeah. Best no, it's and I I tell you the other thing that is done for my kids. They've seen successful people. They've also seen people that had a billy that drove it in the ditch, yeah. and so they were able to make choices and see. And that's that was that was great for my kids, and and now my grandkids are experiencing it. So that's <laughs> how do you, you handle know. those conversations? Because you've you've done this forever. You have a player who's got all the talent in the world, but you can see where that path is heading. Because you know that age group of kids, they're not always going to listen to you until th until it completely falls off the rails for some of them. Yeah. How do you have that conversation with 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 the player? It's like, hey, this is where I see you heading, yeah. and it's not going to end <laughs> up in a good place. Well, I'm I'm pretty straightforward and pretty crass, <laughs> and don't mince words. And and I think kids in the end appreciate that. I don't hold grudges, I, but I I will lay into them, and then it's over. But yeah, I I'm uh, pretty straightforward, and and I I believe in second chances. I believe in third chances. You know, sometimes the easy thing to do is get rid of people. You know, but but at a point, you know, you become a distraction. You you. You don't care. Um, you're dragging the other 25 down, or embarrassing the program. You know, enough's enough. And so, but how do you yeah, circle back with them? I've had I have a good group chat with some coaches, and and they they deal with this, especially the high school guys. They they deal with this a lot with kids that you're trying to coach them, and they don't always handle the tone well. How do you circle back with them? Like, hey, listen, my dad said it a lot. Listen to the content, not the tone. Yeah. Because my dad yeah. was going to get into you. He would. And and well, he would always circle back and be like, hey, listen to what I'm saying, not how loud I'm saying it. Because um, yeah. I, I think that's the biggest difference with this generation of kids. I have a 21-year-old and 18-year-old. I think they take the tone personally sometimes, and, and it's not personal. Listen to, yeah. to what I'm saying, not how I'm saying it. No, it's, it's definitely different. And, you know, all kids are different. Some kids, you can bring them in one-on-one -on -one and get a lot out of them. And then I've had some guys, the best way to <clears throat> deal with them is just embarrass them in front of their peers. Yep. Yep. You know, they don't like that. Yep. So whether it's going to class or what, you know, some kids, you bring them in the office and bust them about it. And yeah. And like I said, I, I think the other thing you, you need to do, you need to praise them. I think you can do a lot with kids if they know you truly care and love them and you praise them too. And I think that's a lot of times you forget that. And that's like I said, I think it's probably the best thing's happened proven I've done in the last 15 or 20 years is like, you know, just like I said a while ago, I'm, I'm sitting here griping at this guy and these other 20, they're taking care of their business. They don't even want to hear that. Like, why the hell I got to hear that? I'm, I'm, Get rid of the dumbass, you know. I, I'm sure they're thinking that. I thought it when I played. So I try to spend more time with those guys, man. I, 
I know, and but it, it, if your heart's in the right place as a coach, too, you want to try to help those ones that exactly. need help, too. You're trying to help yeah. everybody. And I think that's where it gets frustrating, too, as a yeah. coach. Is like you know what you're trying to pull out of them, yeah. and it, it gets frustrating as a coach. And you see I've the potential had, that they have as a person and as a player, and you're trying to get them that out of them, so you do yeah. want to try to help them. But – You've you've got that way more figured out than I ever did. You, I mean, I, the amount of games that I, you've won. Um, I've got a young man that I, he's not a young man anymore that played for me from New York. Uh, when Mel Zitter was going with the Youth Service League, I used to get Coach Ward hooked me up with him, and man, Mel would send guys. And I had a young man from from New York, and he was a good kid. He was just never been to college, and it was just you know the first fall was just back and forth, and just. And I know there's a few times he would just walk off and duck his head. I know he was probably just going to kill me. Well, he he signed with the Yankees, played a little while in pro ball. Now he's back in New York and helps in the academy, does stuff at a school, and doing wonderful. Great, great young man. Well, he's always calling me about guys, and he send guys to me, and he'll say, "I got to check this guy out." You know, he I don't know, and and a lot of times I'm like, "You need to look yourself in the mirror." And I will say that to him. I go, he goes, Coach, I don't want you to have to deal with people like me. And I go, Freddie, man, you're a great story. He goes, I know, but I, I go, just stop. You know, it, that because it I'll, takes I'll a special, the it takes a special just, coach like, to be able to do that. Like, yeah. like, you know, and my I coached two kids from New York at Western Illinois. They were two of my hardest ones. They end up being good, but they they yeah. were two of my most difficult ones because they'd never been out of the city before. Yeah. And, Everybody talks about New York City as being this tough place, but it's it's very enclosed there, and so they're in a bubble in New York City. Where you get outside of that, that's a, it's a different part yeah. of the world outside of there. Yeah. Chicago and yeah. New York City, those were my good players, but toughest parts because they're kind of insulated in a city bubble there, where they don't yeah. realize how the world actually works outside those two places. Yeah, yeah, I had a good laugh with that, Freddie. Come on, man, we can be proud of you. So. <laughs> That's good. How often are you guys lifting? We, uh, in the fall, we, we do what we call in season and off season. And, uh, obviously, I guess that's kind of a no brainer. But we, we, when we get them in here in the fall, we go three days a week. And then also, we have our hitters, they hit four, four times a week on their own. We have a sign in sheet. You know, if you're going to be worth a damn at this, you better be hitting on your own five or six times a week. But, we have that, and then uh, hey, but hold the hitting. You give them a checklist of what they got to do, or you just give them. Yeah, a I show them stuff to work on and so different what, things, and they kind what of do are on their own. On that, it's like you got to get this amount of reps of doing this. Yeah, yeah, and then I just kind of leave a lot of them. I'll show them things. Hey, again, back to purposeful stuff, and uh, then about the middle of October, we're still out practicing. Then Corey takes them and. And uh, really starts pounding them with the uh, lifting. And we go f- four days a week, sometimes five and stuff. Uh, we do that all the way through till we go home. They come back in January and start hitting. And then we kick back into our three-day a week. We're in the three. We go the three-day a week. And then we have a pitcher set up on a, a program, obviously, when they're going to throw and lifting and, and stuff. And I'm, I'm so old school. I, I still they use They lift the game day? You got pitchers lift game? You have pitchers lift game day? Well, they'll lift afterwards, the ones that, that want to. We don't have any do lift. Now, some, you know, I'm a little bit – I trust guys a little bit, the, the ones – and I, I tell people, hey, everybody's different when it comes to lifting in season, and I'm not a cookie-cutter guy. Now, that helps the guys that are driven, kills the guys that are lazy. But I – we we I kind of back off a little bit on the lifting. I, I believe in it, and I think they lifting. know what they need. Obviously, you said it. Every kid's different. They know what they need way more than prescribing well, what they we, need. We got off the bus at ten fifteen last night at the field, and there was a trail to the weight room. Yes, and, and that, I love that's what it should after be. games. I love yeah, that. and that's and and I know the strength and conditioning community. You know, I I understand where they're coming from, but. Yeah. Every kid is built different, and you can't yeah. sit there and tell me that if, if a kid feels better doing it that way, no matter what the science says or rest and recovery and that, if they feel better, they're going to play better, regardless of what it looks like. 
And and the thing I do with our hitters, the old school and me, and you probably get a laugh if you came here. And, and this this is old minor league stuff. I, I'm a PVC pipe guy. We we got a whole bunch of pieces of two foot two inch PVC pipe. It works. And we're spinning those things every day after practice. You you can burn their hands and wrist up. And I, I tell you one thing I read years ago. Those small muscle groups like that that there is science to that part. With those small muscle groups, it takes them less time to recover, so you can bang them every day. I smoke them every day after practice. It takes two and a half, three minutes. But I, tell I think you, that's why we're running into some elbow, more elbow issues too now with pitchers, is because I don't think they're crushing their forearms and hands yeah, like they used probably to. Probably so. And I tell you something that that I read a long time ago, and it's even in uh, Ken's book. Davy Johnson talked about when he got traded to. Uh, the Braves from the Orioles, Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron was nuts after games, wrists and forearms. And Davey Johnson said he was getting ready to leave the clubhouse. He goes, where are you going? And Dusty Baker was a, talks about it, was a rookie, and Hank took him under his wing. And they said Hank would kill them after games. So Davey Johnson said, I would – he would make my wrist and forearm chart so bad, I was in tears. He said, Hank could be smoking a cigarette working on <laughs> I had teammates that wouldn't work out with me because I, I was on my own plan. So I I was on a six-day-a-week plan, and I'd have some teammates that would come in with me in the weight room, and they they lasted a couple sessions, and they wouldn't come in with me anymore. But I needed to yeah. do that for, for myself personally. Yeah. Just, well, you know, there's a lot of big There's leaders, a mentality so I, to it. Like, I, I when, just think it builds mentality, too. I've, I've spent a lot of, you know, with guys I had in the big leagues, and Julio Lugo was one that there's times we'd be there, and the whole family, he get, we'd go eat after the game. He said, Coach, I got a lift tonight. Okay, you know, he, you know, there's, but yeah, I, I we, I, I think that helps hitters. I, I've seen it, and, you know, I don't have any proof, but, you know, we always hit, and guys get stronger here, and guys, you know, and you're not talking, Guy has power, has power, but still, all of a sudden, those guys are getting balls in the gap and balls jumping off their bat better. And yeah, the hand strength is we we do that every day. Any team building stuff you do in the fall with them outside the classroom? Well, or you just build it in the classroom. <laughs> that and I tell you that thing that we do that builds builds character real quick. And you know, we're at a junior college. Probably the only thing that I would do different. If all of a sudden I just walked in another room and there was a budget and there was money just flowing everywhere, you know, I don't make any bones about it. We're in the Bush Leagues here, you know. We're scratching and clawing. But one blessing that we've had is we go and work Oklahoma University and Oklahoma State University football games. And we make a lot of money. But if it's an 11 o'clock game in Norman – we leave Warner at four in the morning. We go on the clock at six thirty, and then drag home. Well, there, it, there's a lot of team the Iowa junior that. colleges do that too. They do that with Iowa State and Iowa football games. A lot of the Iowa junior colleges do the, that. Too. There's team building in that yes, because you have to deal with BS and you're all miserable together. Yep. And uh, and I go. I, one thing that I think is important as a coach. I see this with a lot of people. I, I get so, you know. With my staff, we don't have any egos like, ah, oh, assistants do this, this, and that. We got stuff we do. Them guys take care of me, you know, my God. But I go. I'm not going to ask my guys to do anything I'm too good to do. And you see, I think that's one thing you I field see. Field work. I, I always help. Some coaches work. anymore. I always I, helped, helped concession stand because we had to do concessions at Western Illinois. I, I ran the concession stand. <laughs> Yeah, and my sisters were like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, I, "I can't ask them to do something that I'm not willing to do of course. myself. It just sends a and it sends a bad they message." They see it, and they know it. So that's that's good team building stuff. And then, like I said, the champions class, and we do a lot of stuff in the community, you know. And it's one thing about being here in Warner, Oklahoma, we're all in the same dorm. Everybody's on top of each other. We're together every day. So, but you know that we. In, in 2019, you know, they, they did some stuff on that. We we turfed our infield, and we raised the money to do that. Excuse it looks me, great, by the way. It looks. We, it we looks turfed awesome. our infield for $125,000. Can't do that anymore. Because we had people in the community doing stuff. 
And if we hadn't done those football games, we'd have never got that done. And, you know, we we didn't play a home game. We thought we was going to have it done. It started raining. We played on the road and, and went to the World Series that year. But it was a neat story, and it's well worth it. But, uh, yeah, we – if I if I ever had a turnkey job done on my field, I don't know what I would do. You know, what it said. <laughs> Any other favorite books for you? Uh, oh, I like to read all kinds of stuff. But you kind of caught me off guard there. I, I, I. Uh, what's your favorite genre? I mean, of book. If you're going to pick up a book, what what's your favorite genre? Of I, I like book? biographies. Okay. I like to read about successful people. Uh, whether in sports or, or other things, uh, I'm not. I don't like read novels. I want something that's true. Uh, I've always been fascinated by successful people. I like to hear people talk, but you know, their mentality is different. Like yeah, the just thing. there's common, common whatever. threads among successful people is that they're yeah. wired different than yeah. the average people. So I, I like that stuff, and uh, and like I said, the the. I, I've, I've been fortunate to be around a lot of good people. And like I said, uh, I, I still use stuff from Keith Gutton and Coach Rowe and, and Coach Ward and them and Tom. Me and Tom still talk. Coach Ward, I talk to him off and on still. And he's he's back in Stillwater. And, and, uh, How much you know, of hitting is timing? Oh, no question. That and plate man and – at bat management. But I, I'm a big strike goes, zone guy. I, for me, timing and, and plate management are, are yeah. very similar concepts because if you're on yeah. time, you're going to manage the strike zone better as a hitter. Yeah, and time. see, I, people come in here, I have a lot of high school guys and other college guys, goes, your team's always hit. And I go, well, I always have good players. That makes it a hell of a lot easier. But then the other thing, I said, uh, you come in here in the fall and our guys are going backwards a little bit because – I browbeat them a little bit about strike zone, and then all of a sudden, you know what that does? And they're hesitant, and they're thinking, and they go backwards. But then when they figure it out, here they come. Because I don't think you can – you're not going to hit the Friday night guys with a bad strike zone. You know, I, that's that's not a real profound statement, but kids don't know that. <laughs> and so managing your bats, that, that's a big thing, like timing, because it obviously pitching – and that's what pitchers have lost now. They don't understand – Pitching is destroying time. Yep. Location is destroying time. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I really beat these guys over the head about their strike zone. And uh, I'm kind of a oxymoron, I guess. I want guys to be aggressive but take walks. I'm like, what the hell? That don't, that don't add up. But it does. It does. Yeah. It does. Be aggressive but take walks. Walks win, too, you know. Be aggressive Especially in the zone. Be- so. And and I think that's when the elite hitters really start to figure out how to shrink their zone. That's where they do damage because they're in a smaller hitting area than the guys yeah. that are up there just whacking away. So you're not going to do as much damage because you're swinging at everything where if you center into a smaller area to hit from, yeah. you're going to be on time a lot more in those smaller areas than you are yeah. in a wide area. And even yeah. with two strikes. Yeah. Yeah. And we – we, uh, you know, I'm big on that. I'm old school, and let's let's not strike out and have an approach. And uh, we still bunt a lot. I'm, I'm, I've always used bunt as a weapon. You know, like we're gonna put pressure on people, and and uh, we well, we teams bunt. Don't have to handle it as much either. Like the teams that yeah. still do it. East Carolina is a good example of a team that really bunts and bunts well. Teams yeah. defenses don't handle it as well. No, they we work have, they we work on it. that. Every day, and it's a tool. It's not you can't. And we uh, again, we and we we've, we've always done that. We we bunted and you know put pressure on people and and uh, those. I'm doing bunting progressions right now. I, I do camp with little guys, so the eight to twelve year olds we're doing bunt progressions. Yeah. For the one hour a week, and next week when I do spring training camp and and that camp we'll we'll do bunt progressions it's not yeah. hard to teach kids how to bunt the bunt yeah. progressions are, are very simple now we, it, there's some nerves with it with the little guys but yeah they just got well, some and, reps to and, get over that part of you it. know button off a pitch machine is a good way to do it but we i still do the the stopwatch drill where we put three guys in a group and we rotate them and yep. pitchers are catching and shagging around and we'll have groups all over the infield 
Again, you can do that in about 10 minutes. We do that before BP a lot. Just a couple times a week. Still. Just, just to, to know. And, and, uh, and one thing that, you know, I got away from and I went back to it is when we take BP, you know, we've got cones set up for oppo and this and that. And I had done this early in my career, set up cones down third base and first base line to bunt to the cone. Like that wears me out, guy. Oh man, I made a hell of a bunt. It was just this much foul. It's foul. You know, we used that to thing. Keep points. We'd set up cones and buckets. Yeah. Just to and so I got away from that in the middle of my career for about five or six. I was like, the hell, I don't know why I did. And man, we're back when cones are set up every day. When you bunt to the cone, you know, that that's it, you can't do anything without a target. And so kids learn to do that. Yeah, that's that external focus. Just like with hitting, if you give them external things to, to focus on for bunting, too, where you're trying to get in this area, it cleans a lot of that stuff. Yeah. It cleans a lot yeah. of it up. Yeah. Do you have a fail-forward moment? Do you have something? You th- do you have a fail-forward moment, something you thought was going to set you back, but looking back now, it helped you move forward? No, not really. Not really. I, we, we've been pretty blessed. I, You know, we... We just, I, I tell you, there in the, you know, we've we've had a lot of success, and we we've, we've been so close. We I've been to Grand Junction six times, and, but we've been so close so many other times. My gosh, there's been some heartbreak in that, and uh, I mean, you just, you know how it is. For a month, you just feel like you had a death in the family, and uh, we've come in second in our regional so many times. We've we, uh, boy, in 96, I tell you, we had a very good club, and that still haunts me. We had to go to Meridian and play two out of three. We won on Friday, then they won the next two. All three were close games. They had a great club. They got beat in the finals for the World Series at Grand Junction on Saturday night in the bottom of the 10th. I mean, they had a good club. That, it's hard know, to win in like Grand that. Junction. That bracket is wild. Yeah. And, it's a and, wild bracket in Grand Junction. Yeah, and we haven't had great success out there, but – uh, I'm at peace with everything that I've done, and we're not done. You know, I'm. I have. Well, I have just as much fight and burn as as I had 20 years ago, maybe more. And I, I'm going to do this as long as I can. The good Lord's blessed me with health, and I'll be 63 and in in uh, May. You don't look I still, it, by the way, you, I, I you still try to tell myself because I I don't look it either. But what yeah. are some of your life hacks? Not hacks, but routines. Do you have anything you, that you do every day? Because you are, I mean, you're in great shape. So. Well, you know, I stay active. In the wintertime, I, I get in the weight room a little bit. During the season, I don't. I don't have time. But I'm, I'm out and I'm active uh, all the time. Uh, so you know, the weight room, I, I like when you look at the longevity studies, strength training is the yeah. best one for people. to. to I get on the elliptical a lot in the wintertime. I used to run a little bit, but you know these the elliptical don't make your knees and your back hurt. <laughs> I am and not so, a runner, man. My wife so runs I, every morning. So I, I get on the elliptical and uh you know, I drink people laugh. I, I drink unsweet tea twenty four seven. I don't drink coffee. I, I, I make fun of people who drink sweet tea. And I just drink unsweet tea out of convenience. You don't have to put anything in it and uh well sugar's another I, one too. Like Yeah, I, I, I have no sugar in it. No sugar. And so maybe that's the deal. I, I've got an old country doctor over here. You know, I, I can go in and out at any time, and he, he makes me have a physical once a year and takes my blood. And I just had my uh, nut this week. My my levels are all good. So yeah. So I get like to keep said, doing I, what I'm doing. I, nutrition's I, a big one for me. I think that's. I've been blessed with good health. I, yeah. I really have, and yeah. and uh, I, you know. Most days, this doesn't seem like work. You know, obviously, you, you've been there. Stuff you do on campus a lot of times is work. But you get to the field, it's not work. So, and I, like I said, we've got a good administration here and good people. This this, this thing, I always tell people, once you get here, when you first get here, like, once you get here, guys cry when they leave. You know, It's about the people. It's always about some, the people. There's some magic here. It's about the so, people. And that's easy for me to sell. Some people think. He's nuts trying to get me to come to, to that little podunk town. And, you know, we're, we're an hour from Tulsa and we're right on I-40. We're 15 minutes from Muskogee. So, 
we got everything we need. You know, you talked about playoffs. How do you manage your emotions as a coach? Well, I, I, I hope I've gotten better at that. Man, I, I, I still get sick at my stomach. I, I do. I, and, I love the butterflies. Like, yeah. And that's where you talk about the visualization piece. Like, you need yeah. that to perform. So, like, I was like, okay, yeah, I got it every morning. I got butterflies ever, before every game. Yeah. Yeah, I, I still nerves and, and stuff. I, we, I try to just approach – we try to keep everything normal. And I think that's where you get the, the deal of – like I said, it doesn't matter if you're playing the Yankees or the Bad News Bears. It's the same routine. I'm big on routines. And uh, you need to do the same thing. That's how you're even killed. That's one thing I'm always the most – I tell our guys, one thing we want to try to do is peg it every day. You know, we we want to – and that's hard, but it's possible because that's mind and heart. You know, and we talk about, like, play a three-game series. If we – like, for instance, we played Friday. We got a doubleheader on Saturday, a seven and a nine. Those are long days. Mentally, physically, but it—it's a mindset. You're—you're going, you're going to decide if you're tired or not. And we talk about that. I, I always talk about that stuff beforehand. Always have. And then I, you know, it's like getting up early. Sometimes going places. Guys, are, well, hey, no, wait a minute. There's somebody right now at six a.m. in the morning doing surgery on a heart. Come on, get over yourself. Or guys are bitching and moaning about this. Hey. There, there's somebody in a foxhole in Iraq right now. He hasn't had a hot meal in a month. Come on. That's. I you know, interviewed we, one somebody from the Marines, Captain Getz, who actually pitched at Princeton, but he was a tank officer. And so I asked him, I'm like, what's the hottest day you ever had? He goes, well, we had some 100 where you take the temp inside the tank, 150 degrees inside that tank, 140, 150 degrees yeah, inside the yeah, tank. Yeah, I can't imagine. Well, that's why we talk about D-Day. I mean, I. Kids don't know, you know, people, to me, you should study history to learn and not go back and not make those mistakes. And, you know, if you read history, really read about D-Day, about those guys in those troop carriers and, and you know, somebody died being shot and that, they couldn't fall over because, and then the door oh, opened. Saving Private Ryan. That's great. great and see, way. we talk about that in breathing. One of the great things that he did in that is when he's got the soldier in the helmet and he's panting, and there's the term choking. You're so scared you forget to breathe. It's Those guys are scared. Yeah. When I saw that, I that went right to the breathing. We talk about that. Our first, when we start talking about breathing in champions class, that's what I bring up is watch that, yeah, that helmet, that guy. It's a bad you know. place to be, fight or flight. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. What are some final thoughts before I let you go? Well, thank you for, for this. I, I really enjoyed this. I like talking baseball. I, I, I've tried to give back, and I, I try to tell young coaches, man, get out and go to practice and don't get something from everybody. You know, there's – and I still, all this time, you try to learn different ways to teach because what I know doesn't matter. It's what my players know. And everybody's different. So I'm always fascinated at learning. I'm, I'm pretty regimented on what I believe, but there's different ways to teach it and, and do stuff. And, and uh, that, that's, I'm always looking for a better way to teach it and to make us better and myself better. So, Thanks for your time, Coach. I, hopefully I get a chance to see you in Grand Junction. I'm actually going this year, so hopefully I get okay. a chance to see Okay. Well, I, I look forward to it. Not to do this any time. If you ever want to just call and just talk baseball. For sure. For sure. Right, call me. It's I'm been great. For you, man. This is awesome. So if you yeah. talk to Coach Ward and Coach Gutton, tell him I said, hey, Coach Gutton is one of my favorites. Shout out to Coach Gutton his last season. Uh, yeah. He he meant a lot to me as a young coach. Um, I've always, Coach Gutton, yeah. been one of my favorites, one of my favorite yeah. human beings in the world. I yeah. just like the way that he handled things. You talk about differences, you know, you see that. My dad and Coach Gutton are so different in a lot of ways. Coach Gutton was always so low-pulsed. Yeah, I just I always respected the way that Coach Gutton handled in game management because just yeah. nothing ever bothered him, and his yeah. teams always played that way. And yeah. I'm a huge fan of Coach Gutton's. Yeah, well, that's that's great. That's great. Well, right. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Finish strong here. All right, we're playing on it. Take care, Ryan.